we are all gathering. First of all, happy Hanukkah to everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today. Obviously, this is a very hot topic. And we, Alyssa, myself, Joel Taubman, you know, talked about what was the best way to handle this. And we settled on the idea of a panel. So we were very excited about people talking today. Um, I'm hoping that we get to learn about this complicated issue and how maybe we can thread the needle as we go forward in this difficult time. So we're very excited today. Thank you. Um, and we'll also talk a little bit about AEJLJ and some of our initiatives before we before we end. So, oh, Rhonda, I'm, this is Baruch. I'm sorry to interrupt. I don't know if you hear it. The Please. siren just went off in our building and a voice came over the speaker said there's a fire emergency and everybody needs to evacuate. Give me one second to find out if this is a false alarm. This is not an effort to avoid my participation here in this webinar. <laughs> well, fortunately, <laughs> you're, you're not up home. first, bro. So <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. you take care of yourself, bro. Let me go. Let okay. me just go check and see what's happening, and I'll I'll mm -hmm. back in. So sorry about that. Just take care <laughs> of yourself. Um, in a recent uh panel discussion that we had, two of the participants were in Israel and. You know, one oh, left right, and yeah. the other left because there was a, I mean, you can't laugh, but a siren was going on, so. Um, okay, so I think I think we will begin because we do have, at, at the very least, our first speaker, um, Mark Rodenberg, um, and uh, I'll do a short introduction. So my name is Alyssa Gresh. I'm the Director of Programming the AIJLJ. Uh, welcome to all. Um, I'm sorry, it, it appears to be a real fire alarm. <laughs> We've got to evacuate. Take care of yourself. Please. I'll take my phone with me. So just put me last. I think Mark, you'll, Mark, you'll hear from Mark and Mark first, and hopefully this will be done. Um, apologies to all. Take care of yourself. Be careful. Okay, so that is, I, I hope Baruch will be okay. Um, all right, to continue. So this webinar is entitled uh, Free Speech, Hate Speech, and Unprotected Speech. And obviously um, this is very relevant at a time like this when we have so many protests and uh, social media is uh, very active. Um, so we really wanted to, as, as lawyers, focus on focus on differentiating and delineating between um, or amongst free speech, uh, you know, and what kind of hate speech is protected and unprotected. Um, we understand that, of course, the First Amendment protects the right to free speech very strongly, especially in the United States. And even hate speech, uh, including uh, anti-Semitism, is usually protected as free speech. So we're going to have our three panelists kind of address like, what it means for speech to be protected. And of course, when does hate speech cross the line and it become unprotected speech? And uh, ultimately, we'll discuss what repercussions people can face for what they say, what we can do to identify and fight hate speech on college campuses, of course, on social media and in the public square. So um, we have three very stream esteemed um, panelists today, and we're going to begin with Mark Rodenberg. Welcome, Mark. Uh, Mark is the Vice President for University Initiatives um, and the General Counsel at uh, Hillel. Hillel. And uh, Mark oversees Hillel's Campus Climate Initiative, working across the U.S., with Hillel professionals and higher education leaders to ensure a campus environment in which every student can feel comfortable learning about and identifying with Judaism in Israel. Mark has spent most of his professional career on university campuses, serving as general counsel at University of Minnesota and uh, Johns Hopkins University. In those positions, he provided strategic counsel and policy advice to university boards, presidents, chancellors, and uh, other senior officers. Mark currently is an adjunct professor of law at American University in Washington. And um, he also served as a visiting professor of law at the Hebrew, Hebrew University 
um, in Jerusalem. He's argued in one cases in the U.S. Supreme Court and many other judicial form, forums, and uh, he received his B.A. from Brandeis and a J.D., um, M.A. and M. Phil from Columbia Law School. Uh, so I hope I got that all right. And uh, Mark, if you could please begin for us, uh, that would be great. Thank you. Well, thank you, Alyssa, um, for that kind introduction. And um, thank you to the AA, uh, JLJ for inviting me here. Uh, this is a very important and, 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 and vitally timely uh, topic, as we all know, and uh, grateful to be able to speak to you about it briefly. <clears throat> what I'm going to do is um, just lead off with some observations about free speech, uh, the, the, the contours of free speech, um, I'll note some closely related ideas, legal uh, principles related to academic freedom, because we're talking about university spaces here today. <clears throat> then I'll offer some observations about unprotected speech, speech that is not protected by the First Amendment, and then speak briefly about hate speech, which is not a legal category, as you all know, but uh, at least in the United States, uh, <clears throat> but is a topic of frequent conversation uh, in university spaces and also in some law decisions. Um, so the origins of the first uh, of free speech are, of course, in the First Amendment. And as most of you know, the First Amendment of the United States Constitution, while it uh, uh, was written and, and adopted in the 18th century, uh, really was a dead letter in American law until the 20th century. For, for uh, almost 150 years, uh, there was very little... Uh, development of principles around free speech uh, in the First Amendment context, right? Because the Supreme Court simply didn't apply uh, uh, the First Amendment to the states or to local governments. Uh, and it was only the incorporation of <clears throat> the many parts of the Bill of Rights into the 14th Amendment jurisprudence of the court that the First Amendment even became relevant. So until the 20th century, um, the, the free speech rights were really not uh, enshrined in the US Constitution's First Amendment. To the extent they had any bearing in the, in the law uh, of the United States, it had to do with local principles of free speech that were embodied in state constitutions. And even there, the jurisprudence was very under, uh, underdeveloped. Beginning in the 20th century, as I said, the, these principles began to be worked out and they were applied in the higher education context. Uh, um, in, in Sweezy against New Hampshire, Justice Frankfurter's uh, uh, concurring opinion really established the initial justification and rationale for applying free speech principles in the higher ed space and, and also in K-12 uh, educational uh, environments. Um, what does the First Amendment say, really? Well, it, as you know, it says Congress shall make no law res restricting free speech, but its application in, in the higher ed and in the K-12 spaces really amounts to this, that a state institution, meaning a state university or a public school, cannot engage in restrictions that relate to the content or the viewpoint of the speaker's uh, speech activity. Right. And this is the key thing to remember that <clears throat> that no governmental uh, 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 body or person representing a government institution can restrict a person's free speech rights in regard of the content or the viewpoint of that speech. On the other hand, governments can and routinely do, and especially in educational settings, restrict the time, the place, and the manner of speech, right? What are we talking about? Uh, it's very common in universities across the United States and in K-12 settings that speech during lunch hours, right? Speech between noon and 1.30, for example, on many college campus malls can be louder. You can use um, uh, megaphones or microphones and speakers and so on. But at 1.30, you can't do it anymore until let's say 6 p.m. Right? Many universities have those restrictions and they apply to certain places, right? So time and place, what's appropriate uh, in uh, uh, academic uh, building hallway is clearly not the same thing as what's permitted at the 
Big Ten Conference football stadium, uh, right? Screaming and yelling may be appropriate and even encouraged by cheerleaders, right? In one setting, but screaming and yelling uh, may not be appropriate and can be disciplined, can be the subject of discipline in another place. That's time, that's place. And then there are manner restrictions that are very frequently imposed, right? Um, <clears throat> the, the, the posting, for example, of literature um, is allowed in certain places on a campus or in a high school uh, cafeteria or in a hallway or something like that. There are posting areas that are permitted, but <clears throat> you can't, for example, put a certain type of exhibit in a location that obstructs the, the ingress and egress of students to class. Right? That's the manner in which the speech activity takes place. So while government institutions under the First Amendment, including K-12 and higher ed institutions that are public, we'll talk about private in a minute, uh, can't make distinctions typically. There are even exceptions to this, but we're, we're just talking for 10, 12 minutes here, right? Uh, can't make distinctions based on content uh, <clears throat> or viewpoint they can and very frequently do make restrictions that are related to the time, place, and manner of that speech. Now, uh, <clears throat> when we're talking about the concerns that uh, animate the Jewish community right now, and of course we have 800 plus Hillels across the United States, we have thousands and thousands of Jewish students who are being um, uh, bullied and intimidated by, um, by declarations uh, of SJP and JVP and other related organizations that are supporting either tacitly or sometimes even explicitly Hamas's depraved assault on Southern Israel. Uh, we're talking about a very sensitive set of issues, right? Because it in, implicates the content of these speakers um, activity, speech activity. Um, and so the question then arises, to what extent can <clears throat> universities regulate that kind of, of speech? Um, before we talk about that, and, and I believe Mark will be uh, engaging in a more focused conversation about these, these specific topics relating to from the river to the sea and so on. And Baruch will be talking a lot about um, how universities may have duties even, even when these speech activities are permitted on campus, right? <clears throat> I'd like to focus for a second on a closely related but independent set of principles from the First Amendment, and they fall under the heading of academic freedom. Academic freedom originated in American higher education long before the development of First Amendment jurisprudence in the 20th century. Academic freedom principles origin, originated actually in medieval Europe uh, when universities were essentially guild-like small organizations that had almost no impact on their communities in the way that universities do in the United States today. And these guild-like operations, uh, the universities in Bologna and, and Paris and Cambridge and Oxford, um, these institutions developed with traditions, very strong traditions of faculty governance. It was for the faculties of these schools to decide what would be taught and how it would be taught. And when the, when the, when the colonists settled on the Eastern seaboard of the United States and began to create little colleges, and by little, I mean really little, like less than 10 faculty members. Harvard College uh, followed soon by Yale, uh, King's College would became Columbia, William and Mary and, and, um, and Princeton and so on. These schools uh, um, uh, developed uh, in, along the same lines as their um, uh, European counterparts, meaning that the faculties of these institutions decided what would be taught and how it would be taught. With the expansion of higher education across America, and we, we don't have time even to begin to discuss the interesting history of this, university faculties inherited those customs and traditions of academic freedom. They're now embodied in a set of guidelines published by the Association of American University Professors, the AAUP. And you can go there and find the principles of academic freedom. 
I won't say anything more about that except to note that it, today in 2023, many faculty and administrators merge these two traditions of thinking about free speech. They merge the law of the First Amendment that is, is, is descended from principles that the United States Supreme Court has elaborated under the First Amendment to the Constitution and these long held principles of faculty freedoms and so on. What they don't uh, mention often, and I'm just touching on this and we can talk about it in, during Q&A if you want, is that students have academic freedom and students have rights to learn and take principled exception to what they are being taught uh, under academic freedom guidelines published by the AUP. And that has important implications for our students, for Jewish students and, and, and Hillel's across the United States. Let me talk for a minute about unprotected speech, right? What is unprotected speech? So the United States Supreme Court and, and other courts, um, including by the way, state courts, we should note just parenthetically that many states have uh, a, a, a legal evolution, a jurisprudence, if you will, of free speech under their own constitutions. And some states like uh, California most notably have by statute applied First Amendment-like principles to private institutions. So while we're focusing principally on federal law and federal constitutional law in this conversation, we should note that you can't ignore the development of parallel sets of, of principles of free speech under state constitutions and occasionally state statutes. Um, but what are, we, what are we talking about in when we're talking about unprotected speech? So <clears throat> under federal law, under the First Amendment, uh, um, there are certain kinds of speech that are barred or not protected by the First Amendment. And, and when I say barred, I mean then the legislature or local governments can proscribe them. They can bar them or punish them. What are, those, what are examples of those kinds of unprotected speech? Uh, incitement is, is one that often comes up in the context of talking about uh, supporting Hamas. And of course, the, the incitement was that issue during the, during the House Education and Workforce Committee hearing last Tuesday, right? When, when um, uh, 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 the three presidents were asked about incitement to genocide of Jews. Um, incitement, which the court has defined to mean imminent encouragement or incitement of imminent lawless action is, is, is punishable as a crime uh, in certain circumstances. So that's unprotected speech. Um, pornography is unprotected speech, right? Every, every week, I think, uh, Barak would know the statistics, people are sent to jail for publishing uh, pornographic images of children and so on and so forth. The Congress has proscribed that by federal law and you can go to jail for that kind of speech activity. Um, defamation is not um, protected by the First Amendment. If, if I defame a particular individual under the common law, the rules of defamation, um, um, you could collect money damages for that kind of speech activity. Um, and then there's the use of speech activity in criminal and other civil proceedings, right? Um, the law of conspiracy, right, relates typically to speech activity. And, and, and it's long been settled that people who utter statements as part of a criminal conspiracy can be uh, punished criminally for uh, uh, that speech activity, which is evidence of the crime. Similarly, the law of attempt, right? An attempted uh, crime often involves uh, proof by examples of speech activity. So without going into any further details, the, the point is simply that there are numerous categories of unprotected speech. But when we're talking about here in the university setting is usually not these kinds of things, right? What we're talking about here are statements that may be targeting particular group or class of, of people. And that takes us to this last uh, topic that I wanna to touch on and then, and then we'll, we'll, we'll let the, the smarter and wiser people have the stage here. Um, and that is hate speech. For a period of time in the early 21st century, meaning 20, 20 some years ago, 
um, there was a very popular movement in higher education of universities exploring, universities and colleges exploring the adoption of what was called hate speech codes, right? Codes of behavior that were written up and actually got litigated that attempted to um, restrict hate speech. Hate speech is, a, is not actually a legal category um, uh, in statutes or constitutional law, but these codes were uh, developed at certain schools in order to create an environment of acceptance and, and um, safety, for, typically for minoritized populations. These speech codes were almost uniformly ruled unconstitutional by, low, by low, lower courts. Um, and the reason for that is because they were held to be inconsistent with free speech norms, at least at public institutions. So the disapproval of these speech codes at, at various institutions is a reference point, is a marker for our discussion here this afternoon. Um, uh, I will note on the other hand, and here we'll conclude, that um, a reasonable argument can be made. This is not an argument that has you know, a long legacy of Supreme Court support, uh, but nor does it have, nor has it ever been um, uh, repudiated by the court. There is a um, reasonable argument that, that university leaders, including the, those who were exemplified um, uh, last Tuesday's hearing and prepared by my former law firm, Wilmer Hale, um, have actually misunderstood the scope of, of free speech ideas on, on college campuses because they ignore the rationale, the fundamental rationale for encouraging free speech to begin with. Coming back to uh, uh, Justice Frankfurter's uh, concurring opinion in Sweezy against New Hampshire, the reason to have free speech uh, on college campuses is that it promotes free inquiry it promotes an examination of the truth. It promotes an examination of ideas and beliefs and promotes the advancement of teaching, learning and research. But speech which is targeted at an insular minority and, and advocates the genocide or murder of, a, of, a, of an insular minority does not uh, match up with, it, it completely is a mis match with the fundamental rationale for having free speech on a college campus. And so there is a possible argument that can be made that universities can proscribe speech, they can, they can limit speech activity, which advocates for uh, a, a genocidal action against a particular minority on campus, not only because it it ha has no uh, roots in the rationale for, uh, for having free speech uh, applied to a campus setting, but because it also is inconsistent with a compelling governmental interest if we're talking about a public university or just a very important interest if we're talking about Harvard, MIT, um, uh, um, and, and Penn, uh, which are private institutions, of course, um, to create an environment where all people can feel safe and secure and focus on their studies, on their learning, on their teaching and on their, on their research. And not incidentally, such speech creates a environment, a hostile environment that violates the university's obligations under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. So while hate speech codes um, are presumptively unconstitutional, it's possible to imagine working out a, a, a legal uh, framework whereby the Jewish community can insist that there are and should be limits on declarations and advocacy of genocide for Jewish students and people or for Jews worldwide or for other minority groups, right? Because those speech activities frustrate the fundamental purpose of free speech on campus and they violate Title VI by creating a hostile uh, environment. Um, I'll stop there. Hopefully you've learned a little bit about the First Amendment, about free speech, about um, unprotected speech, and about how we might navigate in this very complicated area of, of, um, of so-called uh, hate speech that targets Jewish students. Thank you, Mark. Thanks so much for 
starting us off with that important inf information foundation. Um, so just uh, just to let everybody know also if that if you have questions, you can write those in the chat and I'll address them afterwards. So um, next, uh, Baruch, do you want to go next? It seems that you're okay. If you're okay with that, then we will do that. Hi, Baruch. Yes. Everything okay on your Everything end? seems to be fine. The The alarm was ringing for a while, but then mysteriously stopped and nobody said anything, but everybody interpreted that to mean go back to work. So here I am. Uh, okay, thank wonderful. You, thanks, Baruch. Um, Baruch. Baruch Weiss is a partner at Arnold and Porter based in D.C., and he's a trial attorney focusing on white collar national security and complex civil litigation. Uh, Baruch handles fraud and money laundering investigations, homeland and national security matters, criminal and civil OFAC enforcement cases, as well as delisting and, lic and licensing matters, securities, fraud, uh, fraud investigations. Um, so, uh, and also, more related to this, Baruch does um, also and also work on Title VI discrimination cases on behalf of university students. Um, he did represent a class of Jewish um, pro-Israel students in a Title VI complaint filed under Title VI with the Office of Civil Rights. Um, Baruch, is there anything else I should add, or are we good to go? No, we're, I think we're good to go. It's okay. Um, Thanks, Baruch. I've long done work on behalf of the Jewish community, especially the pro israel Jewish students on various campuses, as you could imagine, since October 7th, the the um, the uh, the number of cases that we've undertaken have increased dramatically. I'm working very closely with um, um, with with actually both marks that you've got here on the panel. Um, uh, especially Mark Rotenberg, we've worked together for quite some time on cases involving various campuses. Um, and I'm currently involved in um, University of Illinois, Rhode Island School of Design, Stanford, um, Columbia, uh, Cooper Union, and um, more, many more. And so I'm happy to be here and thank you for having me. All right, so I'm going to try to address one particular question um, as we talk about the First Amendment on campus, and that particular question is is this. Um, uh, let's assume for a moment that the harassment on campus is being effectuated by speech that would fall within the protection of the First Amendment. What happens? What is the obligation of the campus and the administration um, if the Jewish community of students on that campus is being harassed, but the harassment is taking the form of speech that would be protected by the First Amendment. So for example, um, if um, students are marching and saying that um, uh, Israel is committing genocide, Israel is an apartheid state, um, anybody who supports Israel is a supporter of genocide, is fascist, Nazi, et cetera. That kind of speech is typically felt by the Jewish students or many of the Jewish students on campus to be um, a, a significant, a significantly impairing form of harassment. I mean, we hear routinely of students who are afraid to go to class, who start going to class only remotely, who don't walk in, across campus unless they're in, in groups because they feel so intimidated by that kind of speech. And in many campuses, what we are hearing from um, folks in campus administration is, what do you expect us to do? This is speech. It's First Amendment protected speech. And um, if there's nothing that, that, that we can do to punish the speech, what is it that you expect us to do? And that's really the question that I want to address here, which is what is the obligation of the campus um, administration when you have speech that takes the form um, of harassment, which, which, which amounts to harassing speech, but is yet protected by the, um, the, first, the first Amendment? So 
let's start first. What are what are let's put aside for a moment the First Amendment question and ask what generally are the obligations of the campus administration to protect its students in the face of harassment that is not protected by the First Amendment? What are the obligations? Of the campus, and those are set forth in what is referred to as Title VI, which prohibits discrimination on campuses that receive federal aid, which is virtually all campuses, based on race, color, and national origin. Um, religion, by the way, is not mentioned on purpose to allow religious universities to hire people of their own religion. So if a Catholic university wants to hire a Jesuit to teach a class, or if Yeshiva University or the Jewish Logical Seminary wants to hire a rabbi to teach a class, they, they don't have to worry about um, anti-discrimination provisions there. So it covers race, color, and national origin. And by virtue of um, some case law and then ultimately an executive order issued in the Trump administration, um, national origin is seen to cover anti-Semitism and, I should add, certain forms of anti-Zionism. Um, for example, saying that um, Jews do not have any right to an ancestral homeland, especially when you advocate on behalf of indigenous rights for others would be a form of discrimination based on national origin that would be prohibited by um, Title VI. Not only does Title VI prohibit active discrimination or intentional discrimination, but it imposes an obligation. This is the point that we need to focus on. It imposes an obligation on universities to step in when there is harassment on campus, say by one student group against another, let's say SJP, Students for Justice for Palestine, harassing Jewish students. It's not the university that's acting. Nonetheless, the university is obligated to step in because um, if it is deliberately indifferent, um, maybe some other standards, depending on the circumstances, but if it's deliberately indifferent um, to the harassment and doesn't step in to, um, to stop and remedy the harassment, it is has violated um, the statute and its federal aid could be cut off. So a university is obligated to make sure that there's no harassment on campus based on race, color, or national origin. Then you have a student group that is harassing the Jewish students based on their national origin, but is doing so through First Amendment protected speech. How is the university supposed to um, reconcile its obligation to protect these Jewish students from harassment under Title VI with its obligation to protect free speech, even, even hate speech, um, even speech that amounts to harassment? And so that's, that's the, the, the question that we need to, um, to talk about today. And again, there are many schools there that are of the view that there's nothing they can do. And that is wrong. Let me say that is clearly wrong. Let me start first with the distinction between um, state schools versus private schools. Um, the First Amendment does not apply to private institutions. It doesn't apply to Columbia or Harvard or Yale or MIT or um, many of the uh, Penn or many of the schools that were in the media as of late. It applies to state schools. So it would apply to um, University of California, it would apply to SUNY, it would apply to University of Minnesota, it would apply to University of Michigan, University of Illinois. Um, they are considered state actors and the First Amendment applies. So when you talk about non-state schools, they can restrict speech. They are not subject to the First Amendment. And so if a school is not a state school, if it's a private institution, the fact that it may have to end up or it may choose to restrict speech in order to comply with its obligation under Title VI to remedy harassment, so what? There is no um, constitutional obligation on the private university to, to protect speech. They can limit speech, and universities do limit, limit speech. Um, and religion. There's some universities that 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 limit it based on on religion as well. As, although we've, as we've seen, religion is not one of the categories in in um, in Title VI. But having said that, um, many many private institutions, the most private institutions, um, even though they're not technically bound by the First Amendment, want to provide the same level of free speech protection on their campuses as. Um, state schools are obligated under the First Amendment to 
provide there. They want the same level of freedom of speech or close to it. So the question then becomes, well, what then is the school supposed to do? And so the answer to that then, whether you're talking about a school that is a state school, which is bound by the First Amendment, or a school that aspires to provide the same level of protection as the First Amendment, is that all the First Amendment does is it prevents the, um, the state from punishing the speaker. It doesn't prevent the state from protecting the victim. It doesn't protect the state from, it doesn't prevent the state, excuse me, from exercising its own right to speech. So for example, if there is um, anti-Semitic protected speech on a campus, the university can disagree with the speech. It can condemn the speech. It could provide counseling and support for the victims. It could obviously provide actual physical security to the victims if they're feeling threatened by it. It could mandate training on campus, sensitivity training, um, non training in non-discrimination issues. And it can establish courses um, that, um, that teach the view of the discriminated side so that there is a more balanced view heard on campus. And indeed, they are required to do so. So Title VI cases, um, if you're aggrieved, um, if you're aggrieved by discrimination or harassment on campus based on race, color, or national origin, can be essentially brought in two ways. One way is by filing in court like a normal lawsuit. And the other way is filing a complaint with the Office of Civil Rights and the Department of Education. And the Office of Civil Rights has put out many pronouncements um, on the, the topic of Title VI cases in colleges. And they've made very, the Office of Civil Rights has made very clear that, um, um, that the schools still need to act. So I'll, I'll give you one quote from a pronouncement from the um, OCR, the Office of Civil Rights. And it says, um, um, this was in a case where there was um, hateful speech directed based on gender. And OCR said, while well, the First Amendment may pro prohibit a school from this restricting the right of students to express opinions about a one sex that may be considered derogatory, the school can take steps to denounce those opinions and ensure that competing views are heard. Um, and so there is therefore an obligation on the part of the school to remedy the harassment and the school can do so by, by adopting many means, including condemning the speech very publicly in a way that will provide um, great comfort um, to, the, to the victim class. I'll give you an example where that actually happened. So this, this goes back to UCLA about eight years ago or so, where there was an effort by the Students for Justice in Palestine to verbally intimidate students on campus not to go um, on birthright trips to Israel. And the chancellor of the University of UCLA issued a statement criticizing SJP for that. And it said, and I'll read to you a relevant part, just because speech is constitutionally protected doesn't mean that it is wise, fair, or productive. Political speech that stigmatizes or casts aspersions on individuals or particular groups does not promote healthy debate, but debases it by trying to intimidate individuals and groups. I am personally concerned anytime people feel disrespected, intimidated, or unfairly, unfairly singled out because of their beliefs. Um, um, I'll give you one more example. This was um, at the University of Miami. Um, where the university's vice president for student affairs issued a statement, this was about three years ago, let there be no doubt, anti-Semitism, hate, and prejudice have no place at the University of Miami, and we stand together with and in full support of our students, staff, and faculty of Jewish faith. So, um, the, the um, and we're not limited simply to pronouncements by the administration, but the administration can actually do things like implement mandatory anti-Semitism training um, on campus. 
and um, it can provide counseling and sessions for students to come and express their, their concerns. So the point here, the point is this, that ultimately, even though there are strong First Amendment speech protections that exist, exactly how far may depend on whether the courts take up Mark's no, um, somewhat novel theory, Mark Rotenberg's novel theory that, that he expounded at the end of his, his session. But there is no doubt that speech enjoys enormous protection in this country. But the important lesson is that um, if, the if, the, if the speech is used to harass, even if it's protected, it does not relieve the university um, of its obligation to protect the students from harassment. And it has to find a way to remedy the harassment. And if it can't punish the speech because it's a public institution or because it has policies akin to a public institution, that's no excuse. It has to find, and it's obligated, legally obligated, to find another way to remedy the harassment on pain of losing its federal funds. Thank you. Okay. So the first time I want to on the exact language. Thank you. Thank you, Baruch. Thanks so much. Um, so um, we're going to go to um, Mark Goldfeder now. Um, so it looks like we may be running a little behind on time. So I, I don't want to cut uh, Mark off, of course. So I'm hopefully. I'm a New Yorker. It's natural. OK. OK, Mark. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, so um, I'll give you a brief introduction, if you don't mind. Um, Mark Goldfeder, uh, Dr. Um, Rabbi. Rabbi Dr. Mark Goldfeather is the senior partner of Goldfeather and Terry and serves as the director of the National Jewish Advocacy Center. Um, he served as the founding editor of the Cambridge University Press Series on Law and Judaism, trustee of the Center for Israel Education, and as an advisor to the permanent mission of Israel to the United Nations. Um, he's also taught law across the country and across the world. And um, most recently, um, well, throughout his career, um, Gold, he has handled cases involving anti-Semitism and BDS issues around the country and lectures and writes widely on those topics. Um, so uh, if uh, if you don't mind, you can take it from there. Thank you very much. And thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, with great respect to both Mark and Baruch, whom I look up to for their work, and we agree on, on most things, I have a somewhat different understanding of what universities can and should be doing. And I want to turn back to the hearing last week as a way to sort of frame that conversation. Again, I'm sure all of you know, last week, the presidents of Harvard and MIT and the University of Pennsylvania all testified before Congress about their very tepid responses to anti-Semitism on campus in the wake of October 7th. And by now, you have probably seen clips of that trio's horrendous overall performance and was punctuated by their very smug inability to answer Elise Stefanik's question and say that calling for the genocide of Jews does violate their school's codes of conduct. And again, on Saturday, President McGill of Penn stepped down and support for the other two seems to be falling slightly. But here's the thing. All three of them were clearly reading off of scripts that were prepared by their respective attorneys. And so no matter what happens to those leaders' professional fate, the question is, what critical error did their lawyers make when they wrote those scripts that led to this, I think, outrageous moral failure? And how should they immediately correct it? And I agree with everyone. Now, the answer lies in a better understanding of the First Amendment. So just to review again, some of this has been covered. Free speech is obviously fundamental, but it does have limits. It's not a pass to harass or otherwise violate the rights of others. It doesn't protect against trespassing, vandalism, assault, destruction of property, speech that's not meant to inform but to persuade uh, or, or persuade but to disrupt lawful endeavors like going to the library or the kosher cafeteria. Uh, importantly, the First Amendment doesn't shield true threats or intimidation. And just recently this year in Counterman versus Colorado, the Supreme Court clarified this is a recklessness standard. So the First Amendment doesn't protect a person who consciously disregards a substantial risk that their communications would be viewed as threatening violence, even if they claim they didn't intend to threaten violence. So 
uh, if you read anything after the hearing, supporters of the president's testimony claimed that Stefanik and her colleagues were somehow asking, you know, trick or hypothetical questions and trying to force him to say that typical pro-Palestinian speech is problematic. And that is nonsense. We live in a real world. And this hearing was addressing a real problem on real campuses. You know, the president's kept on asking for context. So here goes. In the context of a post October 7th world, waving a Hamas flag and cheering on terroristic slaughter, even as baby hostages are still being held and bodies are being recovered, or announcing that armed struggle, i.e. murder, is legitimate, and yes, calling for the genocide of Jews, whether you phrase it as supporting resistance by any means necessary, or one solution intifada revolution, Nazi hints, or a chant of from the river to the sea, contextually, in the real world, today, on campus. Those are all examples of communications that can realistically be viewed as violent threats. So to be clear, calling for the genocide of Jews exactly like the pro-Hamas student groups on campus have consistently actually been doing for the past two months does create a hostile environment for Jewish people, does violate Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and is not protected by the First Amendment. And from a legal perspective, I think it is easy to see where the general counsels went wrong. Those horrible answers were written under what I think, with respect, is the mistaken assumption that the only limits a university can put on student speech are the ones that were discussed in Brandenburg versus Ohio. In that case, about a Klan rally, the Supreme Court, as Mark already said, held that a state could only infringe on speech that's directed to inciting or producing imminent lawless action and is likely to incite or produce such action. And Brandenburg is famously a very high standard. And that is precisely where these universities are hiding. Again, notwithstanding the well-known research confirming that the kind of inflammatory anti-Semitic rhetoric they're using leads directly to anti-Semitic violence, school officials have been telling students and parents and now Congress that their hands are tied because in most cases, we'll exclude Rutgers and Cornell, there hasn't been direct enough incitement. Now, again, and Mark pointed out, even under Brandenburg, schools can still impose reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions. And I'll go a little bit further than Mark went. The court in Grainard versus City of Rockford, 1972, explained that the crucial question is whether the manner of expression is basically incompatible with the normal activity of a particular place at a particular time. And I believe that common sense dictates that rallies celebrating calls for anti-Semitic genocide disrupt the educational enterprise and functioning of a school. But again, that argument is unnecessary because I believe that Brandenburg is the wrong paradigm for schools to be using. In a case called Tinker versus Des Moines, 1969, the Supreme Court explained that the Constitution actually does allow for schools in particular to restrict expression that will, and I quote, materially and substantially interfere with the requirements of appropriate discipline in the operation of the school or invade the rights of others. That is the standard that these presidents and everyone who works for them should have been vigilantly enforcing. Now, again, for the record, even those pundits who incorrectly defended the president's testimony as being legally correct, if morally tone deaf, they had to admit that it represented a glaring double standard because each of those schools has in recent years protected other minority groups, even from microaggressions, by purposefully restricting speech that their leaders did deem offensive. So if you're only suddenly concerned about protecting free speech when that speech targets Jews, there's a, there's a word for that. But regardless, again, private universities like Harvard, Penn, and MIT, as Baruch said, they can restrict certain speech without triggering any constitutional issues. But even a public university is not a public street, and the rules for what has to be allowed on each are very, very different. Tinker was a high school case, but in Healy versus James, 1972, a university case, the court cited Tinker to hold that university officials do not have to tolerate student activities that breach reasonable campus rules, interrupt the educational process, or interfere with other students' rights to receive an education. And that's especially true when the speech takes place in a school-sponsored forum or is otherwise reasonably perceived to bear the school's imprimatur. For example, NYU's SJP. The court has also repeatedly held, by the way, in Bethel versus Fraser in 1986 and in Hazelwood versus Kroll in 1988, that schools have even greater latitude to limit student expression if they can establish a legitimate pedagogical concern. Now, ensuring that all students 
have a safe and harassment-free environment is a pretty legitimate pedagogical concern. And schools don't have to wait for a breach to actually occur. Administrators are allowed to act if they can, quote, reasonably forecast that the expression in question would disrupt school discipline or operation or violate the rights of others. In Melton versus Young, for example, a court ruled that a school could prohibit the wearing of a Confederate flag jacket because it was reasonable to assume that would be disruptive in an environment of heightened racial tension. Today, calling for the genocide of Jews is no less likely to disrupt than a Confederate jacket. So under Tinker, it is more than reasonable to forecast that there will be substantial disruptions that would violate the rights of Jewish students to a non-hostile educational environment if groups are allowed to host events that glorify and celebrate the murder of Jews. And schools can, and I believe must, act now to prevent that from continuing to happen using both common sense and the relevant case law to draw that appropriate line. Again, the limits in the First Amendment are there to help the government with its primary responsibility, which is to protect all of its citizens from harm. And authorities have to be consistently, vigilantly enforcing that law correctly. So the hearing was incredibly effective in exposing a massive problem. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how many presidents fire or fall if all the men and women left in place don't also fix their policies. And that way, those lawyers are very lucky because there's no need for real radical change, just as we said, a little bit of tinkering to try and put the balance back in place. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was excellent uh, from all three of you. Um, I'm just going to give Rhonda Lees, uh, one of our VPs, a moment to speak, and then uh, we'll move on to a few questions. So great. Thank you so much, Alyssa, Baruch, Mark, and Mark. Um, just want to tell you very briefly that um, AADLJ has been working in this space. Obviously, we've been in touch with um, all three these people in different ways. So just to let you know, we host seminars like this. We have also been writing a series of letters to uh, universities like Penn, like Rutgers. We also have written to the Red Cross. We have not heard back, but uh, getting the word out on this and fighting for the subject is really important. So if you are not already a member of AAJLJ, I would ask and encourage that you do so. And also we do have what we call a letter writing campaign, even though it's much more than that. So if you want more information, um, please reach out to either Alyssa or me. Uh, let's go to the Q&A. Alyssa, I know that you and I have both received some questions. So why don't we start? Yes, I think I do have all of them. Um, so I also do wanna thank uh, Joel Taubman who really helped with with um this you know setting up this webinar so um uh so we'll move on to the Q and A um if you could give me one more. yes um I'm sorry I do not have my own office <laughs> um. So um, we're going to start with, um, let's see, we do have a few questions. We'll start with um, Tabia, uh, Tabia Lee. Hold on one moment. Um, so Tabia asks, um, how is a chant like globalize the Intifada classified and should it be allowed on public university campuses under the law? So whoever wants to take that. Please feel free. All right, bro. Um, sure, I'm happy. I'm happy to take it. That that is a that is a very good question. And um, so, globalize the intifada um, is understood by many Jewish students as a call for violence. Because what was the intifada but a series of bombings, suicide bombings, um, uh, that were directed at. Um, innocent civilians in Israel in order to intimidate and to spread to spread terror. So in that sense, um, I would analogize the um, um, a call for intifada as a call for genocide. And so from a legal perspective, the answer to your question, uh, the first question, does that amount to harassment? Um, I think it does. I think it easily does. And I think the, the presidents of the universities would now, um, uh, who would now 
apparently would now concede that calling for the genocide of the Jews is harassment. I think they would have to they would have to agree that calling for an intifada is also, despite the count the, the countervailing claim that it's meant as as somehow a a call for for some peaceful change. I mean, I've never I've never really bought that in light of the history of the the intifada. So once 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 you arrive there, you get into the question that we've um, discussed and debated today, which is in a private university that clearly would not be protected and could be punished. And if it's in a state school, if it's in a public university, would it be protected by the First Amendment or not? Um, and um, you've heard that there are uh, you know, the more absolute views of the First Amendment that would say that because it's not calling for imminent violence like today or tomorrow, it would be protected. And you've heard the view that um, since it's calling for it in a more generalized fashion, it would still be protected by the First Amendment. And then you heard the view, but it may be an exception to the First Amendment because it's on campus and the university can protect the students who need to continue learning in the school environment. So I think the answer is, um, it is that is a good, complicated question. And I think uh, Mark uh, Goldfeather also wanted to add something as well. Yeah, it is a really good question. I just want to add that if you if you've ever handled any kind of harassment or discrimination case, everything is contextual. And that's sort of what the uh, presidents were alluding to, but they missed the point, which is this. Let me give an analogy. The word Holocaust didn't always refer to the Holocaust. The word Holocaust is an older Greek word that is a translation of the Hebrew word ola, or burnt offering, an offering that was completely burnt. If a student group on campus today stood up and called for another Holocaust, and then feigned shock and confusion when people were upset and said, oh, no, no, they meant they wanted it. They just love those biblical burnt offerings. We wouldn't believe them. OK, so contextually, we shouldn't believe that people don't know exactly what they're doing. If they're really calling for some kind of a peaceful resolution, use those words. Don't use words that also contextually can be referring to calls for the genocide of Jews. Yes, thank you. Um, so another question that we have, actually, Rhonda, can I, can I ask you to take over the Q and A for a bit? Sure mind. thing. Hi everybody. Okay, um, Deborah, if I can release you to do it, and then I have one other question that came through. So, Deb Foyer. Um, thank you. First of all. These presentations were one better than the other. Thank you so much. It was really helpful. Um, I've written in this space, but I, I still found this extremely helpful. Um, but I feel like the testimony of these three presidents was like a ruse, um, trying to pull the wool over the Congress and the public by bringing these fine points of free expression law and the reason I say that is twofold. First of all, because they forgot, they don't think about First Amendment when it comes to shutting down pro Israel speech. They don't think about First Amendment when it comes to microaggressions against every sort of, uh, all sorts of different things. They suddenly remember the first free expression in the First Amendment when it comes to um, harassment against Jews and the right of other people to express their hatred against Jews. And the second reason is I watched some clips last night from universities, the mobs that are rampaging through universities, screaming these dubious um, slogans that you guys talked about. Where does that have, what, what if anything, does that have to do with actual, with the kinds of nuances that you're talking about? It's, it feels quite different. I'm losing you. I'm sorry. Deborah, I'm losing you, but hopefully folks got enough. Mark? I I fully agree with you. Again, if you only discover your free speech principles when that speech is targeting Jews, that calls into question whether you're operating from a place of principle at all. So I, I have to agree with you on that. And I will also say that, let's take it, for example, a chant of from the river to the sea. Number one, a recent study found that I think most of them can't even tell you what river and what sea they're talking about, and that's really important to know uh, for a variety of reasons. But number two, if you really believe that 
let's start with the assumption that yes, from the river to the sea has meant many different things to many different people over the course of the last 75 years. It is also true that Hamas has adopted that phrase to mean the killing of Jews. So I can't, I truly can't imagine if there was any other phrase that also meant the genocide of a minority group, the universities would say, well, it's okay to use it if you just explain afterwards that you didn't mean the genocide of that group. It just doesn't pass the smell test, the common sense test. So I agree with you. We're not being held to the same standard. <clears throat> The double standard itself is problematically anti-Semitic. It wouldn't be so bad if if universities really held these deeply held free pre, you know free speech principles consistently and weren't only finding them when that speech targets Jews. Okay. Um, are there Mark? Did you have a comment, or should I go to the next question? Yeah. No, I just wanted to supplement and support what Mark just said. Um, you know, universities, uh, and I say this as a former general counsel. Uh, two big universities for 20 some years. Universities typically, not just occasionally, but typically will punish certain types of speech that targets uh, an insular minority on a campus. We have real live examples of um, uh, members of the university community who will place a noose, for example, in a setting where they know black students will be present. Uh, and universities typically this is the common practice, will take very stern disciplinary action against a, a, an employee of the university or a student, any member of the university community engaging in that speech activity. No, no Supreme Court will say that that's not speech activity. It's highly expressive. And it's not up to the, um, to the university to say to the black students who are deeply troubled by that and, 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 and attacked in that manner to say, well, you know, uh, actually a large majority of people in this country uh, historically since the 18th century who have been hanged are white men. So you shouldn't be troubled by that, right? That's not an answer to the black community. That doesn't hold up. Uh, I just wanted to supplement that with a graphic example of what Mark's talking about. Um, it's not up to the person who engages in the offensive speech activity to say, well, I can come up with some plausible reason why the minority group shouldn't be offended by it. Now, of course, you can, you can come up with other examples where the speech activity is implausibly, unreasonably deemed to be offensive, right? But uh, the, 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 uh, a, a quotation in context in 2023, we're not talking about 1985, in 2023, after Hamas's brutal murder of civilians in southern Israel, to quote from the river to the sea in context is a quotation from the Hamas charter. And that's the relevant issue here right now in November and December of 2023 on campus. Great. Um, thank you very much. Um, we got a question from Howard Marks about uh, the new rallying cry of the left is ceasefire now. And we all know that ceasefire now means, you know, Hamas wins, we don't get the hostages back. Can you comment on how that cry, um, especially, well, with or without accompanying um, harassing behavior is something that needs to be addressed? And if so, how? That's not a, an easy question. So. Okay. I'm happy to take it, um, uh, uh, stab at answering that. So from from our perspective today, talking about the First Amendment, I, I think that um, calling for a ceasefire in a conflict that has taken place, whether it's domestic or overseas, would be classic protected speech. Um, uh, the First Amendment protects the right to call for a ceasefire there. You could... People can call for a ceasefire without um, and believe in it without having any anti-Semitic feeling or anti-Islam feelings. Indeed, um, the, the Jewish community is split and Israel is split. The hostage, many of the hostage families are calling for a ceasefire because they think that's the best way for the families to be released. So um, I view that as something is very, very, very different than calling for an intifada or by, by statements like by all means necessary or from the river to the sea. That is, that would be protected speech if, of course, you're dealing in a state school environment where the First Amendment would apply. Now, that doesn't mean that it's good or bad policy. Protect, first, the First Amendment doesn't look to the wisdom of the opinion that's being articulated there, but it would be protected speech. 
Okay, uh, great. Uh, Thank you. Let me jump in for one second. I, I, I absolutely agree that it is protected speech. I think that in the in, in the environments which I have seen it over the last couple of weeks, it is generally usually used in an anti-Semitic fashion. Um, it's absolutely possible for people to say without having anti-Semitic feelings, but uh, I just came this morning from a, a hearing where they were about to pass a resolution listing all of the alleged and fake war crimes Israel has engaged in and using those to demand a ceasefire. That's anti-Semitic for a number of reasons. But also, again, if it allows for Hamas to remain in power and they're calling for that, Hamas has said that the October 7th attacks were just a rehearsal and they were going to do them again. Just last week, a Hamas leader in Gaza gave a public speech, it's available if you want to see it, saying that we should plan to kill and exterminate every single Jew on the planet. That includes every person who is Jewish on this call and all of their family and their loved ones. And any kind of plan that leaves in place Hamas and doesn't address that is, in my opinion, oftentimes used in an anti-Semitic fashion and should be called out as such. Great. Thank you. Um, we I see a, a couple of other questions here. Deb, have you finished your question? Okay, I think that she has. Um, one of the the comments or questions yes, that uh, reached me so was much. great. Thank you. Um, with MIT, um, they were originally, and I'm putting that in quotes, going to take action against some of the students, but then they found out that. That, that some of these students could be deported, which means that they no longer have access to this revenue. So um, I ask a very awkward question, which is, you know, for students that are not U.S. residents or not or U.S. Um, citizens, does any of this conversation change? And if so, how? So, um, well, I, I think I started last time. I'm 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 happy to take uh, uh, to respond or Mark Mark if you want to respond. So. As, as a general matter, constitutional protections, as a, as a general matter, do not apply to non-citizens who are not in the United States. Um, constitutional protections apply to U.S. citizens, wherever they may be, and to non-citizens um, who are in the United States. So um, um, uh, as a Bye -bye. general matter, a student who is here on a student visa who is not a citizen of the United States still has um, First Amendment rights to speak in the United States. Okay, thank you. That's um, sort of what I heard. Okay, I, I think we can take about one or two more questions if that's good I'm for good. people here. Um, say that, uh, and I'm actually, right. what, go ahead. Mark, please. I, I was gonna say, yes, they are allowed to speak, but um, there are laws in place to uh, expel and to deport people when they say certain things. And I believe that those laws should be enforced. Right. Those, those would have okay, to be, um, that would have to be unprotected speech. In other words, if, if they said something that was protected by the First Amendment, they couldn't be deported for that. At MIT, for example, what they said did fall under the, apparently the visa categories that would require them to be reported for possible deportation, and they didn't want to do that because they felt bad for the students, which in my mind just empowered the students to go back and do whatever the heck they wanted. So that would mean, so if the students, for example, called for violence in a way that would not be protected by the First Amendment, um, yes. they could and should be deported for that. That's true. They were the clearly and deliberately violating the rules. There were repeated warnings, and they were going to enforce it until the visa issues came up and it became clear that they would be deported and they pulled back. And I think that is an exercise in misplaced mercy. Great. Um, I, I'm wondering if uh, I will get one final question, but um, is each of you comfortable in reverse alphabetical order um, from uh, giving a one minute, if you would like, uh, closing? on on this topic is reverse reverse alphabetical order first name or last name reverse i knew you were going to say that Brooke, as, <laughs> as i opened my mouth but you know what since you're here let's start with you um so i i think i i think that that what what our discussion today illustrates is that there are some very complicated first amendment issues but let's not forget that there are certain core basic issues that we should not let um, uh, uh, the First Amendment complications complicate those issues. In other words, there's some things that cannot be done, and um, regardless of one's view of the First Amendment. 
and we're seeing them done on campuses um, today. For example, treating Jews differently than other protected groups, that cannot be done. Whether it's being done with protected speech or not protected speech, the First Amendment does not give the state, um, does not impose upon the state an obligation to allow Jews to be differential, differentially, excuse me, pardon, pardon that, um, treated. Um, and we are seeing that happen um, across campuses in, and happen in ways that is simply not constitutionally protected. Um, and we have seen in many situations where um, Jewish students are punished in ways or, or being sub, sub, uh, subjected to treatment that goes far beyond simple speech. Um, students who are being punished with bad grades because they articulate a position that a professor doesn't agree with, for example. We see more and more of that, Jews who are not permitted to participate in certain organizations um, because they are Jewish or they have pro-Israel views. So that, um, um, and then we are seeing that that even in situations on campus where pro-Palestinians are, are, are engaged in speech that in the view of some is protected, they are doing it at times in manner that clearly violate university rules and they are not being punished for that. So. Um, whatever the scope of the First Amendment, and it is broad, by, by any definition, it is broad, there is an enormous amount of harassment of Jewish students that, that is going on that involves speech um, that should not be protected and should be punished. So I actually, I find that very optimistic. Mm -hmm. So thank you that there are things that can be done. Okay, um, uh, Mark Rottenberg. So um, no, I, I just want to thank you, Rhonda. I just wanted to uh, dot the I on one point that Barak made here. I think we, because we're coming off of this uh, spectacular uh, leadership failure of last Tuesday in the in the House hearing, um, we, we've lost a little bit of focus on what we should be talking about here in regard to free speech. Jewish students are being bullied and intimidated every day every day, every week, and, and universities need to be held accountable for pro providing an opportunity for Jewish students and Jewish student organizations to fully and proudly participate in the life of the campus. And it's a free speech problem for Jewish students that needs to be addressed here, right? So the focus and properly, and, and, and I, I, I'm part of this <laughs> uh, group, on, on punishing uh, genocidal advocacy is one piece of what we should be talking about. But I would submit that the more important issues have to do with what Barak was talking about and what Mark and, and I and, and he can give legions of examples, right? At the University of Chicago, <clears throat> the Jewish community, this is weeks ago, tried to put on a rally in the, in the, in the, in the central quad they were shut down by a bunch of SJP bullies using megaphones and the university dean on duty, that's a designated person who was supposed to patrol this and make sure that the Jewish community had an opportunity to be heard in the context of SJP daily, daily um, misuse of their free speech rights on the campus using bullhorns in front of classrooms and so on the Jewish students' rights and the Jewish community's rights and the rabbis who sought to speak there were shut down. And that's another example. And Baruch has, and Mark uh, have legions of examples here. So the free speech focus uh, was properly over here today because of the Tuesday hearing. But I would respectfully submit as attorneys, we need to focus on protecting Jewish students' rights to be heard, Jewish students' rights to be proudly demonstrating their Jewish identities in the many diverse ways that they wish to do that on our college campuses. And we and attorneys, as attorneys, can help the universities enforce their rules to make sure that our Jewish students are not bullied and intimidated. So I, I wanted to just balance the conversation in that way, Rhonda. Thank you. Very much appreciate it. Mark. Sure. Again, I want to first of all, thank you for having us and uh, thank you to Baruch and to Mark for all the incredible work that you that you both do. Um, 
I agree with everything that was said in the last couple of minutes. I do want to add one point, and I, I, I agree that we shouldn't focus entirely on the extreme examples, but I think there's a really important reason to focus on those calls for genocide and some of the other extreme issues is because, as I mentioned before, the vast majority of the students who are at these protests, and I have spent dozens of hours watching or attending these protests over the last two months, they're just there for the pizza. They really don't, they, they couldn't find Israel on a map if you gave them Egypt and told them to go up. It's really that bad. Um, and if you can separate 50% of the people from the, you're not going to change any hardcore minds. You're not going to change the minds of SJP members. It's just not going to happen. But the most common question I get from students on campus is, how do I go back to class after this is all over? God willing, Israel wins. How do I go back knowing that so many kids in my class support Hamas? And the answer is, I'm hopeful that most of them don't actually, they just don't understand anything that's going on. And if you can draw a line and say, look, these are actually calls for genocide and really label the extremism of some of those positions, you might actually cut off, I don't know, 40 to 60% of the people at those rallies who really didn't understand what they were doing. And so I think 100% we should be focused on protecting those Jewish students, but it's important to call out the complete radicalization on the far left of this because it might actually save some of the students and in the end benefit our own Jewish students who need to know that they're not alone. Thank you. So thank you very much to our three speakers, Baruch Weiss, Mark Goldfeder, Mark Rotenberg, uh, Joel Taubman for pulling this together, Alyssa, who had to leave, AAJLJ in general. Um, please keep in touch with us as we will keep in touch with you because one of the things that I've been telling people is don't be upset, just do something. You know, right, co Contact your member of Congress, contact your university. If they're doing the right thing, say thank you. If they're doing the wrong thing, you know, every everyone's asking for money. I just tell you that when I get a request for money from an institution like that, I write back and I said, can you share your position on Israel with me? And, and I see what they say. So um, thank you very much. This was hugely helpful. We appreciate the assistance in the fight. We will be in touch. And I want to wish everybody, no matter where you are, a very happy Hanukkah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.